Have you ever gotten an implant oh so close to the depth you wanted it? Oh so close to sticking in the bone with all the torque you could ask for, only to have it stop going deeper and start spinning in the hole? It's a sickening feeling. You've done all the hard extraction, monostrut, bone foundation guide, bone reduction, guide placement, and all the drilling for your osteotomies. You're finally placing the implant. You're so close to the bottom of the hole and yet suddenly, that uncooperative little piece of titanium stops going in. Frustrated, you push harder, trying to force the implant into the hole. Instead, it just sits there at the same depth, turning in place, stripping out all of your perfectly drilled bone. A spinner. What's a dentist to do? Let's back up a bit. How does a spinner happen in the first place? As usual, it comes down to physics. Let's talk about the laws of old Sir Isaac Newton. Ow! Don't worry, you won't be tested on this part. Newton's third law states that when two objects interact, they apply forces to each other in equal magnitude in opposite direction. What does this mean? Let's use an example. If there's a guy standing next to a wall and he pushes against the wall with 10 pounds of force, the wall also pushes back with 10 pounds of force in the exact opposite direction. Since we're applying the same amount of force, the system is balanced. Our guy isn't moving, but neither is the wall. If our guy now applies 15 pounds of force to the wall, the wall also pushes back with 15 pounds of force, and the system remains balanced. Again, neither of them move. If our guy could somehow push with 10,000 pounds of force, however, the wall would suddenly give way. The wall couldn't withstand such a massive amount of force. The system would be out of balance and the wall would break. So how does this apply to implants and spinners? Let's say you've drilled an osteotomy and you're ready to place the implant. As you place the implant into the hole and turn it with the driver, the threads in the implant engage the bone and pull the implant down into the hole. You don't have to apply any additional force to the driver to push the implant into place. It pulls itself down. We can represent the force applied by the threads with red arrows like this. Because the threads are applying force in a downward direction without a significant resisting force acting on the implant, the implant is able to descend into the hole. As the implant goes down, its threads cut channels in the bone. Since all of the threads on the well-designed implant have the same pitch and spacing, each consecutive thread simply follows the channels that have already been cut in the bone. As the implant continues into the hole, additional threads engage, adding more downward force. As the implant reaches the bottom of the osteotomy, the flat bottom of the implant will make contact with the bone. If you've planned your case properly and drilled your osteotomy to the prescribed depth, your implant will reach its proper depth by this point. You'll stop driving the implant and you'll be good to go. However, if something went wrong with your osteotomy depths or case plan, then once the bottom of the implant touches the bone, the bone will push back against the implant just like the wall in our physical physics example. You might be inclined to think this isn't an issue. Can't you just push down harder on the driver and force the implant to go into the proper depth? Unfortunately, no. Here's why. Think about a pencil. On one end, you have a sharp point for writing. On the other is a very blunt eraser. If you hold this pencil between your two flat palms, and push with equal force on both, what will happen to your hands? The hand with the pencil point will hurt a lot more than the one with the eraser, right? You know this to be true, it's logical. Why does this happen? You're applying equal force to both of them. It's all about surface area. On the pointy end of the pencil, we have a tiny amount of surface area with a force being applied through it. On the other hand, however, we have a much larger blunt eraser. The same force is applied through this end, but it's spread out over a a much greater surface area. Let's look back at our implant. As soon as we get to the bottom of the osteotomy, we get this resisting force applied to the bottom of the implant. That flat bottom is our eraser, and the bone is our palm. Imagine trying to push the eraser straight through your hand. Wouldn't work very well, would it? The tip of the implant isn't designed to cut through bone. It's flat so that it sits on the bone securely and so that it's less likely to damage vital structures it encounters. Pushing on the driver won't make the implant go any further. If those resisting forces from the bottom of the bone against the bottom of the implant are greater than the total force applied by all of the threads and your pushing force, you will get a 
spinner. Here's how that works. This tool here is an auger. It's designed to dig holes in dirt. This is an implant. What's the difference from an engineering perspective? Absolutely nothing. When someone uses an auger, it spins down into the dirt and the threads engage. When they lift up on the auger, they apply an upward force, the same type of force applied to an implant when it hits the bottom of the osteotomy. What comes with the auger when it's lifted up? All of the dirt that the threads engage in. So what do you think happens when an upward force is applied to an implant? Yep all that bone gets stripped away. So where is this likely to happen? Where should we expect the bone at the bottom of the hole to be really hard? One situation is this. When I hit the lingual cortical plate with the tip of my implant, it's not going anywhere. Anytime you're going into D1 bone, you should also expect to have particularly hard bone at the bottom of your osteotomies. So, lower anterior, especially on older patients, mandible, etc. However, there's one simple rule that will help you prevent spinners altogether. When you get to the bottom of the hole, you're done. If for some reason you've done something wrong and you need to go further, you have to back the implant out and drill the hole deeper before putting the implant back in. This is especially effective if you're doing fully guided surgery. With a guide, your osteotomy and implant depths are constrained by the guide. As long as you've planned and executed properly, you shouldn't ever run into a depth issue. So what happens after the implant is placed and you put on a non-functional prosthesis, a healing cap, or a healing abutment? Now, as soon as the force is applied, mastication, for example, the arrows flip. The threads are no longer pulling the implant into the hole. They're now resisting the downward force along with the bone at the bottom bottom of the implant. As long as the upward forces equal or exceed the downward forces, the implant will be in great shape. Now we know that spinners happen when the upward resisting force on an implant exceeds the downward force applied by the threads. This usually occurs when an implant bottoms out in an osteotomy hole and can't go in any further. We know that the safest way to fix an osteotomy that's too shallow is to take out the implant and re-drill the hole. Finally, we know that we should never drive the implant past the osteotomy depth. We should trust our depth stop on our guide, and we should always use a guide to maximize our chances of success. Smile Engineer, out.